Hello and welcome to our uh, recording for Bible class for uh, January 30th, 2022. Uh, we're continuing to look at witnesses to Christ, people from the life of Jesus, and we're continuing to look at Peter. We, we looked at Peter um, and, his, and his life, the way he pointed to Christ and encountered Christ in the Gospels uh, last week, um, but since there's a little too much to cover then, this week we'll cover what Peter does after the Gospels, after Easter. All right, and we'll look at use this hymn as our opening prayer. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, the church's head, you are her one foundation. In you she trusts before you bows and waits for your salvation. Built on this rock secure, your church shall endure. Though all the world decay and all things pass away, oh hear, oh hear us, Jesus. All right. Uh, and I found this. Uh, it's from the ESV Study Bible. Um, but it's a interesting kind of good timeline to give you at least some idea of uh, what's going on with Peter in his life. Um, and there's some some question about some of the dates um, of things, but it uh, gives us a, at least a, a good idea. So, um, so Peter's called. We talked about that, and that'll actually be the gospel lesson next week on February 6th for the Mission Sunday, uh, the calling of the disciples. And that's in um, either 28 or 30. Again, Jesus has a three-year ministry. Uh, so it all depends on whether you date his crucifixion to 30 or 33 AD, and there's various reasons for that. Uh, but then Peter uh, preaches at Pentecost after the crucifixion and becomes a key church leader. Uh, then, as we'll, we'll look at, um, he witnesses Cornelius. Um, won't touch on the imprisonment here, but he's, so he's imprisoned and rescued. Um, then eventually he leaves Jerusalem, he ends up being in Rome, um, and then of course is Ro in Rome while Emperor Nero reigns. Um, and Peter has two letters, um, and he's martyred, he's killed in Rome uh, after Nero uh, blames the Christians for the fire in Rome in 64 AD. All right, and so for our first moment of Peter. So after the ascent, after resurrection, after he goes through that threefold restoration at the end of John. So Peter denies Jesus three times and then Jesus restores him um, three times. Uh, then the, we get the ascension and then we get right into, into this. But uh, first here, this is where we get Peter is acting as leader. He says, uh, Luke, uh, Luke writes, in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Uh, and so here we see Peter starting to take, take charge after, uh, after the resurrection, after the ascension. Um, so he's the one who suggests that they need to pick a replacement for Judas and they cast lots and, and, and get a replacement for him. Uh, then we get, uh, of course, uh, Pentecost. Um, and, uh, and so after they, they get the tongues of fire and they're spe speaking languages, then Peter's the one who stands up and preaches. Uh, and so, but Peter, standing with the eleven, uh, lifted up his voice and addressed them, the crowd that had gathered, because they... So, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. So, unless they're tailgating at nine in the morning, they're not, shouldn't be drunk yet. Uh, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Uh, and I'll skip the rest of the Joel passage. Um, so then this is how Peter continues on. So men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. Again, he's talking in Jerusalem. This is 50 days after Jesus was crucified. So people here would have still known what Jesus had done. Uh, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be bound by it. And then he does some more biblical quotations about how David's, not, David's ancestor won't see, or descendant won't see decay and stuff. All right, so Peter finishes his sermon and then says, Now when they'd heard this, they were cut to the heart 
and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Uh, and so here we kind of again get uh, Peter doing a few things we we see him doing. First off, he's continuing kind of that role as, as leader or spokesman of the disciples. Um, we also see him continuing to point people to Jesus. Uh, but we see kind of this, we see more, more happening too. A lot of times, uh, you know, we talk about how the miracle of Pentecost is that the Holy Spirit gives the people these different languages. Um, but it seems, you know, looking at it over the last few years, I've noticed it's almost more of a miracle that this group of disciples that had been hiding out in the upper room that had all fled in the garden, that Peter had denied, even knowing Jesus three times, this, you know, group, they end up being able to boldly proclaim Jesus in Jerusalem, you know, this is 50 days after Jesus has died. And so we've got a lot going on there. And it's how, how things are going um, about what's... That the, the Holy Spirit almost is more at work giving them the boldness to proclaim this message than in anything doing anything else. And of course that message, you know, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So again, Peter continues to point... Uh, point everyone to Jesus. He's a witness to Jesus. He talks about all that Jesus had done, all that he had seen, and all that these people had seen too, because they, again, been in Jerusalem. Um, you know, six, 60 days, you know, after, or 50 days after Easter, they would have, you know, some of these would have been long-term residents. Some of them could have been pilgrims who were there for Passover and were back for Pentecost. And some could be new people who were back for Pentecost, but had been in other areas where they'd heard of Jesus as well. All right, and then um, in Acts 3, we get another Peter taking on a little more of Jesus' uh, role here. Uh, so Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, so like 3, three in, the, in the afternoon. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him as to John and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And so here we get, um, again, Peter and John uh, continuing to do what they were, had been doing, uh, continuing to be active. You know, they're, still go, able to, they're still going to the temple at this point, even though, of course, it was the, the temple leaders that had condemned Jesus. Um, they still go to the temple to worship, um, but they are starting to do then some of the miracles that Jesus did. Um, but again, not to put glory to themselves, but to as signs to be witnesses to point people to Jesus. Because uh, again, just as Jesus had you know, made the lame walk, uh, so now Peter was able to do that, again, in the name of Jesus, pointing people to Jesus. All right, um, but of course doing this gets them in trouble with the authorities and Peter and John are called before the Sanhedrin and Peter again being the one being, being the, the spokesman gets to, gets to talk uh, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them rulers of the people and elders if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man by what means this man has been healed then let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified whom God raised from the dead by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John 
and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized they'd been with Jesus. And so kind of, again, the key things we see here, um, boldness, again, um, Peter, of course, denied Jesus, and, and John, you know, according to John's gospel, ends up staying with Jesus all the way to the cross, uh, but is still, um, we don't necessarily hear a whole lot about him, but so they're, they're still being bold. Uh, they're, you know, they healed someone in Jerusalem and appear before the same group that condemned Jesus, and yet they're willing to speak boldly, pointing them to Jesus and, um, and what he's done. Um, we also see something that we get um, later, um, we'll talk, talk briefly about, um, they're uneducated common men. Um, you know, that we hear about them being fishermen. Um, and yet, uh, and so of course, when we look at Peter, Peter and John then as being authors of, uh, well, Peter wrote, we have two letters of Peter uh, and John, we have, um, of course, wrote, would have wrote, written the gospel, three letters in Revelation. Uh, we think that, you know, they're uneducated common men. How could they have done these things? And that's why people would think that some there's either multiple Johns or uh, different Peters. Uh, someone else wrote the Peter letters in Peter's name. But we'll see, just because they were uneducated doesn't mean they were, they're unintelligent. Holy Spirit can work through them, and they're not working alone. All right, then the next big Peter thing uh, is in Acts 10. So the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop to the, about the sixth hour to pray. So this is like noon. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat, because it's lunchtime. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? They said, Cornelius a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited him in to be his guests, the next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. All right, and so here we get um, Peter's, again, stubbornness sort of getting here, um, uh, that he's been a, been a good Jew his whole life, so he doesn't eat bacon, um, doesn't eat pig, you know, doesn't eat pig, doesn't eat shellfish, you know, keeps all those uh, dietary laws, and yet here's God telling him, that you can eat anything. Um, but of course, it's not just about about the food laws, but it's about the, um, it's about the, the outreach to Gentiles too, and the fact that then it's paired immediately with the centurion, uh, with Cornelius' servants coming, and Peter being willing to go back with them when, you know, he wouldn't be able to enter the Gentiles' place, uh, being worthy to be unclean. Um, so it... Peter's mind gets changed this way. Of course, again, we get that three threefold repetition there, um, and a reminder of, you know, that this, you know, things we think of as simple would have been hard, would have been pretty ingrained in them. Um, and then, of course, the the whole moral of the story is too that then uh, Peter understands then that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears Him and does what is right is acceptable to Him. And so, um, you know, again, Peter uh, kind of shows that rock. Rock hard stubbornness, it takes a vision from God for him to realize that God's working through the Gentiles too, but uh, once it does, he's on board, or at least mostly. We'll see, Paul doesn't think he's on board as much as he should be. All right, um, then of course there's all other things we get. Um, in Acts 12, he's, Peter's saved from prison. And then uh, in Acts 15, that's the Council of Jerusalem, and we won't 
touch on the whole thing this time because uh, that would be a, take a while on its own. Um, but the short version is that um, there's a disagreement over how how Gentiles are becoming Christian. Um, and so there's a council at Jerusalem with Peter and James, the brother of Jesus, who's Bishop of Jerusalem, and then Paul. And they talk, and then they, the compromise they come up with is that um, they're still supposed to, um, that converts to Gentile converts to Christianity don't need to be circumcised, don't need to follow all the laws, uh, but instead still, still need to follow the sexual morality laws, still shouldn't eat things um, and th things with blood um, in them. Uh, so, so those those sorts of things. So there's there's some middle ground, um, and we see Peter and Paul both being very strong, stubborn personalities, kind of clashing a bit there. Um, but they they seem to get over it. Um, Paul, though, of course. Um, strong personality sees it later at least a little differently or at least blames Peter uh, for some of the problems he has in Galatia. Um, so on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, so here's Paul acknowledging, okay, Peter's, Peter's going to witness to the Jews, I'm going to witness to the Gentiles, we'll keep our separate spheres and work things will work well that way. For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And Paul's also using, taking advantage of, he's recognizing Peter's authority, but also kind of using it to bolster his own authority. Uh, and when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So they've kind of recognizing they're in different contexts, um, need to do things slightly different ways, so go ahead and separate and do those things. Only then they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Um, we see that Paul, you know, later on his, on his last minute missionary journey ends up part of what he's doing there and part of why he ends up getting to Jerusalem to be, cruci uh, to be arrested is to, because he's collecting for support for, uh, from the Gentile churches for the Christians in Jerusalem who are facing a famine. Uh, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Uh, and so here we get Peter. Again, he'd had this miraculous vision, but he's still eager to fall back, especially um, when, you know, peer pressure, so to speak, from, from James, from uh, people from Jerusalem who hear about what the Gentiles, what's going on in Antioch, and send people to try and straighten them out. Um, but yet, um, also kind of a good reminder, too, that... Um, uh, the, so we talked about last week uh, that the church recognizes the confession of St. Peter on January 18th. Well, on January 25th is the day of Peter and Paul, because uh, tradition tells us they were both martyred around the same time in Jerusalem, uh, or in, in Rome. And so um, kind of recognition that despite all their differences they, they've had in, they had in life, um, that they were <laughs> united in their death, united in Christ, uh, and so... Um, need to be remembered together that way. Um, again, see Peter's uh, kind of stubbornness, rock, rock-headedness, clashing with Paul. Um, but um, Peter ends up then being able to to point people uh, to Jesus, and, and his concern with you know keeping the Jewish laws is more of just not probably again what he what he'd grown up with, uh, and also that um, not offending the Jewish Christians. Um, but it's a hard balance to have. Now um, we still have this this kind of problem sometimes on on the mission field when um, you know someone from headquarters hears about what things are going on out there and uh, not ignoring the context and that kind of thing. Um, so and and personality disagreements between two different people too. Um, but a good reminder too that uh, Peter and Paul were able to um, be in conflict 
Um, then there are definitely hurt feelings uh, between both of them, but they end up reconciling later. All right, and then we get to uh, Peter's letters, uh, which again, uh, there's some some debate in scholarly cir circles over whether Peter could have actually written them. Again, if he's an uneducated common fisherman, um, but as we'll see at the end, it's um, he probably had help. Uh, so Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And here's a map kind of showing, again, where Peter's writing. He's probably writing from Rome. Uh, again, this is towards, towards the end of, his rice, end of his life. And he's talking about Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So essentially, northern Turkey. You know, what is what we'd what we'd call it call it um, uh, notes here that kind of the Taurus Mountains here had a form of dividing line between the Mediterranean coast and then uh, the rest of it. So Paul Peter's writing to the rest of that, um, which again would include some of the church some churches that Paul uh, Paul would have founded. Of course, we see Ephesus and and Colossae uh, here in that in those areas, um, but. Peter's writing more, and especially because he's talking about the elect exiles of the dispersion. So he's, Peter's especially writing to the Jewish Christians uh, in that area. So, who according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and the sprinkling of his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejo rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so uh, Peter here is writing, again, to this dispersed group of exiles in that um, area of uh, what we, we now call northern Turkey, and that... Um, he's writing especially to, to encourage them uh, in, in suffering and, and persecution. Um, being in Rome, Peter can presumably see some, some things are coming. And, um, but he's also, of course, Peter's a good one to write about this because of all, you know, we, what we saw him in the Gospels, that he, um, you know, he, he suffered. He was uh, persecuted. Uh, you know, he's, he's been arrested. He's been uh, and he, he understands the fear that would drive people to run away. Uh, he understands the stubbornness that would keep people standing firm. Um, and so is writing to encourage them. Um, and then at the end of the letter, then we get a, again, get a hint of what, how he could be able to do this. Um, so he writes, um, that, so it's by Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon who is likewise chosen, sends you greeting, as does Mark, my son. And so a couple things to go here. Uh, Sylvanus uh, is apparently his, his scribe, um, and so would have been able to help him write. Um, again, um, also by this point, Peter's been, you know, presumably preaching, teaching stuff for 30 years. He probably learned a, f learned a thing or two in the time from being a fisherman to being a uh, to to be able to do do some some writing, um, or at least he'd he'd probably write and Sylvanus would, would, would write. Um, again, Peter, you know, he's he's not dumb. He you know, if he was running his own fisher fisherman's business and partners with James and John, he, you know, got a little bit of that entrepreneurial uh, business spirit in him. Um, but so when people say he was too uneducated to have written this, well, maybe, but this. Again, he's had time to learn, and he's got help. Also, uh, again, just like uh, John will do in Revelation, um, so ba she is in Babylon, it's likewise chosen, so Babylon is, uh, 
you know, symbol, code word for Rome. And she, who's in Babylon? That's she referring to the church personified. Uh, and Mark is the one who's, a, who's with him. The, John Mark we find mentioned a few times uh, throughout the Bible, throughout the New Testament. Um, he especially is uh, known, he, he travels with Paul on one of his missionary journeys, but then um, he is the, the he, does, he, he, he leaves, Paul gets upset at Mark, and so then uh, Barnabas splits off with him, and that's why Paul and Silas go, go on, a, on a journey together, um, while Barnabas and Mark goes, go elsewhere. Uh, but then tradition also tells us, too, that uh, Mark, uh, John Mark, was, is the author of the gospel that we know as the gospel of Mark, um, but, and that he bases his, his gospel on Peter, on what he, what he learns from Peter. Um, and so that's, that's his connection to an apostle, because again, the gospels um, uh, needed to be written by, um, uh, for books that, that made the New Testament had to be written, written by or connected to one of, to one of the, one of the, to an apostle. Uh, and so, uh, Matthew and John are, are apostles and then Mark is connected with Peter and Luke talks about interviewing all sorts of people. Um. So again, so that so Mark tends to is focused on Peter. Uh, it's also why some people think that um, Mark is, among other, not only the shortest gospel, but has kind of the, um, you know, lowest Christology is one of the fancy theological ways to talk about it. That it's um, shows Jesus more humanly, and also shows the disciples as uh, being more human, more fallible. Uh, Peter re remembering all that he, all the struggles he had in doing stuff. All right, uh, and then Peter, though we have two letters of Peter. Um, so Simon Peter, servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I skipped a little bit just to, uh, for time's sake, you can always go through and read those later. Uh, but therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in the body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. So Peter's saying, I'm, gonna, I'm going to die soon. I know this, um, and so I need to tell, keep telling you these things, though. So. Uh, then I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. So again, that's, part, that's why he's writing, and that's presumably part of why he tells Mark everything to, for the gospel. So no one's working to um, do that. All right, for, you know, this, is, this is, again, Peter being a witness. Uh, so for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when, we received, when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. So this is Peter remembering, you know, like 30 years later, uh, you know, what happened on Mount Transfiguration. Uh, and we have the prophetic word more can fully confirm, to which you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing that this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Again, so even at the end of his life, then Peter is recalling what he witnessed, what he saw of how of what happened with Jesus, and especially that what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration? That we we see see that, and so Peter's again, again talking about that emphasis that so he was that he was a witness. He saw these things, but he's told people so they they should believe his Peter's testimony because now the time's going to be coming soon when none of the people who saw Jesus are going to be around. But you have they'll have the testimony of those who saw Jesus and they have the word again is more fully confirmed um, that because they you know when when Peter Peter James and John see the transfiguration they don't know all that's going to happen they don't know that this is going on into um, into Easter uh, that Jesus and Jesus is going to die and rise again um, or all these other things that have happened to help confirm their faith help confirm what they're doing um, so we see that there
Uh, and again, reminded that the yeah prophetic word is more more sh made sure it's more sure it's a light shining in the darkness, um, so that as they're facing their struggles, that uh, if they look to God's word, uh, that will give them help and hope and comfort. Uh, again, early church tradition says Peter dies by crucifixion in the year 64. Pro uh, uh, again, there's there's some debate a little bit over over exact dating, but. Uh, great fire of Rome in 64, and uh, Nero persecutes Christians at that point, and Peter and Paul are done that way. Uh, we see here, uh, too, uh, Peter doesn't feel worthy to die the same way that Jesus does, so he gets crucified upside down. And so we'll end here with our uh, reminder to the, the last verse of the hymn we just looked at. Uh, and for your gospel, let us dare to sacrifice all treasure. Teach us to bear your blessed cross, to find in you all pleasure. O oh, grant us steadfastness in joy and distress, lest we, Lord, you forsake. Let us by grace partake of endless joy and gladness. All right, so thank you very much for, for listening. <laughs>